done the hall, actually, not like a school at all. So <laughs> really happy to gather here. It's the first time I've come to this particular venue. Um, so, yeah, my name is Venerable Chanda. Um, I'm a disciple of Ajahn Brahm, who's way over in Perth at the moment. And uh, he's asked me to come over here to start things in process for having a monastery for women to ordain. So it'll be another opportunity for female ordination in this country. And hopefully, you know, some of you can come and stay there too, men and women. Um, so this is what I'm doing. And in the meantime, of course, teaching and just learning to be back in my own country because I haven't lived here for many, many years. So I've been mostly in Asia and uh, Australia for the last few years. So that's just a brief introduction. And it's nice to see many people that I already know here considering that I knew nobody two years ago. <laughs> and also big thanks to the London Insight and to Louise for organising this. It's really lovely to be back again and to share a little bit about mindfulness. So the topic today, which I wanted to just give a brief overview on, is uh, mindfulness, and we titled it, Is Mindfulness Enough? So you can probably already guess the answer to that <laughs> from the way it's phrased. But um, I wanted to go into what mindfulness is and also where its context lies in the Eightfold Path because often in modern mindfulness, you know, we hear about it everywhere in all kinds of parts of secular society, which can be a wonderful thing, but sometimes it's extrapolated from its context and it's seen almost like a one-fold path. You know, there's just this one aspect, mindfulness. Whereas in the Buddha's teaching, mindfulness is something which has a very specific purpose and a very specific aim. And the Buddha teaches various... Um, places where we can direct our mindfulness. So first of all, what is mindfulness? So basically the Dhamma is something that has to be understood by directly seeing. Okay? And mindfulness is that which brings experience into focus so that we're able to access it and wisdom is able to arise. So it brings phenomena into our experience. And it has a sustaining focus on experience so that we can see into it for long enough to start to see a little bit deeper into the nature of phenomena. But there's often this concept of something called bare awareness, and I think this is something that is not really found in the Buddhist teachings. And it's problematic because often what comes between us and just an instant um, objective understanding of reality are the things called the five hindrances. And this is talked about a lot in Buddhist meditation. These five hindrances are known as things which are imperfections of the mind, the Buddha taught. And he said they weaken wisdom. So does everybody here know what those five hindrances are? Yeah? And they start with sensual desire, yeah, which can be roughly translated as wanting, wanting anything other than this present moment, you know, wanting, which takes us out of what's already here and prevents us, in a way, from developing enough contentment in the present to be able to really stay with it and listen deeply into what's arising. So these are the, this is one of the problems. And also, of course, we have our own experiences, we have our conditioning from childhood or from the culture that we're born into, and our own views about reality. And these kind of things can come in the way of having a kind of very objective awareness of, of phenomena as they arise at whatever sense door. So these bend and distort the truth. So I'm sure we've all had the experience where we meet somebody and we have an instant kind of sense of whether we like them or not. And it's not an objective sense. We don't know that person, their history. But something about them triggers a memory from the past or a feeling we've had in relation to someone who they remind us of. And because of that, we can't really meet that person as they are in the moment. You know? Or sometimes we have a preconceived idea of somebody already before we meet them. Like this is the person who always asks for a lot and is always sort of very demanding. So when we meet them and they say, oh, I'm, I'm having trouble in my life at the moment, we immediately kind of have our guard up, you know, what do they want from me? Mm -hmm. So this is the way that kind of we distort the reality. And I like the way that Bhikkhu Bodhi talks about the job of mindfulness. He says it's almost to declutter the cognitive field. So in this cognitive field, we have all this clutter, all our junk, you know, and our perceptions, our hindrances, and it's bending and distorting the truth. So we only see the object either a little bit distorted or very faintly, very dimly in the background, you know, as if there's a big mist and we can just see something trying to shine through, but it's not, it's not very clear to us. So one of the first jobs of mindfulness is to actually generate wholesome states in the mind and undermine these hindrances so that we have a better chance of seeing things as they actually are, yeah? 
So in that case, we can say that mindfulness is a kind of clarity and a presence of mind. And the Buddha also contrasts this to something he calls muddle-mindedness, which I'm sure is very familiar (laughs) to everybody. And he says muddle-mindedness is like a lack of clarity, and it prevents us from remembering or um, recalling things that happened in the past a long time ago, which is another interesting aspect of mindfulness because it's also this recollective sense So we hear the instructions, for example, or we hear the teachings, and we know what we're supposed to do, but we forget. We're not able to recollect because our minds are so full of other things. And this is what it means to be model-minded. He said if we have this model-mindedness, we don't sleep well, we can't go to sleep well, we have dreams, nightmares, and we wake up grumpy, all because of this model mind, which is quite interesting because it's a similar thing to the description of someone who doesn't have enough metta in their heart. They also don't sleep well. So I think the two things, again, this is starting to bring in the compassion, the compassionate aspect of mindfulness. You know, as we're aware of things, we're able to respond in a way that's ethical, in a way that's kind to experience. Yeah? So this is one aspect of mindfulness. Another one is that mindfulness is directed to something. Okay? So we're always mindful of something. And, you know, in modern-day mindfulness, I think we have all kinds of different methods. And I heard that some people go on mindfulness courses about eating chocolate, for example, (laughs) which is, you know, all very nice. (laughs) And it probably increases our enjoyment of the chocolate, you know, feeling it melting and feeling the sweetness fill the mouth and maybe the sensations in the body that are a little bit tingly. But um, is this one of the areas that the Buddha directed us to, you know? The Buddha was very clear in directing us to the four areas of existence where we assume a sense of self or where a sense of self is kind of hiding. You know. And for many of us, that isn't necessarily the body. We kind of have enough wisdom to realize, yeah, this body is one thing and my mind is another. They're interrelated, but they're not the same. But then there are other areas. So the body was the first area that he talked about in the Satipatthana Sutta. And then the next one was feeling which is a little bit of a misleading translation. I think our teachers in Perth have started to translate it as um, effective tone of experience. Ajahn Brahm actually calls it just experience, but um, the point here is that there are three very distinct qualities to every experience. And so the Buddha was directing our attention to that because these qualities are the places where the defilements again can arise. So in relation to, for example, pleasant sensation, there's an underlying tendency to lust and craving. I'll get into that more in the day. But these are the areas that he directed our attention to specifically because we tend to assume something permanent, something constant, and also something, perhaps we're looking for happiness in these areas, and they're not really reliable places to look for that happiness. Yeah? So that's another aspect of the mindfulness. And then um, also in the text, it talks about awareness, but most of the time the Buddha mentions it, he puts it together with another word, which is sampajanya. So sati means mindfulness, and this carries the connotation of also recollection, as we said. But it also comes along with sampajanya, which is the same word as panya. Sampajanya just means a kind of, um, it's a kind of intensifier. Sampajanya is just intensifying the word wisdom. And what's this, what this is understood to mean in, in the Buddhist text is that mindfulness has a specific purpose. Yeah? So we can be mindful of shooting a gun. We can be mindful of stealing. I mean, burglars apparently are very mindful to the extent that um, in Perth we have this meditation center and the rooms are quite echoey and the doors kind of bang a little bit when we walk in and out. So Ajahn Brahm says, do burglar meditation. Pretend you're a burglar and open the handle really slowly (laughs) and walk through, you know, in tiptoes. And you can kind of get quite into that. And this is how burglars do things. There's another story uh, that Ajahn Brahm talks about where uh, a couple of his disciples were watching television one evening. Television's very kind of compelling and tends to, you know, generate strong mindfulness on the program we're watching or on the emotions it evokes. Um, But these two were so absorbed in the television, probably because they were good meditators, (laughs) that um, at the end of the program, they looked behind them and the shelf was empty. (laughs) <laughs> and they realized that during their television program, the burglar has actually come into the same room they were sitting in and taken all the stuff. So the burglar was very mindful. <laughs> but is that the kind of mindfulness the Buddha talked about? I don't think so. 
Yeah? So there's also another, another aspect of mindfulness, which is uh, mindfulness as a gatekeeper. And this uh, points to a kind of protective power of mindfulness. Mindfulness is a protection. And I'll read a little quote from the text because this explains it very nicely. I think it's a nice definition of mindfulness. So this is from the Anguttara and Nikaya, which are the um, numerical discourses for anyone who wants to have a look in, in the text directly. Just like a gatekeeper in the king's frontier fortress is wise, competent and intelligent one who keeps out strangers and admits acquaintances for protecting inhabitants and warding off outsiders. A noble disciple is mindful, possessing supreme mindfulness and alertness, one who remembers and recollects what was done or said a long time ago. With sati as a gatekeeper, that's mindfulness, a noble disciple abandons the unwholesome and develops what is wholesome, abandons the blameworthy, and develops what is blameless. Yeah? So again, this is sort of pointing a little bit more deeply. There's more nuance in this than just bare awareness, where we allow everything to come in the mind. Mindfulness always also carries wisdom with it. You know, we need to know what are the wholesome things that we want arising in our mind. Who are the friends and who are the enemies to our meditation? And we need to start to identify that and cultivate the mind in such a way that we invite the friends in and we know how to look after them when they come in. As a nun, I'm often looked after. I have to be because I can't use money. I can't uh, travel on my own unless I have an Oyster card, which is great. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so often I'm in the position where, you know, I put myself in someone else's hands and I have to trust that the food they give me won't be poisoned or anything. <laughs> Usually, of course, it's absolutely wonderful. And, um, you know, I notice the way that they treat me. They make me feel welcome. They sit me down, make sure I'm warm. You know, find out what, what I like to eat, what suits my stomach. And I want to stay. You know, I tend to go back to those places. And it's the same thing with the positive qualities. You know, if they come into the mind and we immediately grab onto them, do you think they're comfortable? You know, they usually want to kind of slip away as quickly as they can. Like, don't control me, please. You know? But if you say, oh, welcome, nice to see you. You know, can I offer you something? Would you like to stay? Then they tend to feel quite comfortable and, and you know, you give them attention and they tend to grow, they multiply. You end up having a house full of guests. Apparently one of the people here who takes care of me cooks so well that you know sometimes so many people come, she's just busy all day, every day, <laughs> cooking, because <laughs> the food's so delicious. So in a similar way, we have to learn how to treat our friends you know, and also how to recognize the enemies and not allow them in. And if they are coming in, we have to learn how to ask them to leave in a very kind way not with force, otherwise they just come back stronger and more determined to get in. Yeah? So this points to the wisdom aspects and also to the context in which mindfulness is practiced. So mindfulness, as I said, is part of the Eightfold Path. It's actually the seventh factor. And the Eightfold Path is quite a sequential thing, mm -hmm. not necessarily a linear path, but a path that feeds back into itself. So it's like a, a circle. We start with right view at a very basic level just understanding that actions have consequences. Yeah? Whatever we do will have an effect. And also the truth of suffering, that you know, there is suffering in life. Life is not fully satisfactory, and there is something to learn. There is something more that we haven't yet understood. So this basic right view kind of sets us up in the right direction, and then it feeds into right intention. And right intention is where the kindness starts coming in. So... And it's a factor of the path that's often overlooked a little bit. Uh, maybe the language is slightly obscure and it's also in negative. So the three right intentions are known as like non-ill will, non-cruelty and uh, renunciation, which sounds okay, but you can also see it the other way around. I mean, non-ill will is a simile for metta, loving kindness. Yeah? So this doesn't only mean in how we relate to others, but it means how we relate to our own mind, how we relate to our meditation object. And then the non-cruelty or um, non-violence, the opposite of this is a kind of gentle attitude and an attitude of compassion. Yeah? And there's been a lot of uh, study about compassion and mindfulness, which is quite interesting because they've had um, sort of control groups who've done mindfulness training alongside groups who've done the mindfulness training but also compassionate behavior training. And it's quite interesting because both groups ended up having a greater sensitivity towards the suffering of themselves and others, 
But only the group who practiced the compassionate training, it led to greater altruism and a greater concern for others and also a kind of um, positive response in relation to a goal. So, for example, if there is suffering and they need to do something about this, it tends to stimulate a positive, um, loving response. Whereas for people who only practice mindfulness, it was a greater sensitivity to suffering, but it actually didn't lead to a desire to connect and to help in the same way. It was more likely to overwhelm. So I find this really interesting because straight away in the path we're expanding the capacity of the mind to be able to receive experience in a very healthy way. Yeah? So this is part of mindfulness. And um, you know, you could see mindfulness as um, a kind of channel through which you can uh, kindness can flow. So I kind of think of it as like, say, when you're scanning the body, you know, you're bringing parts of experience into focus. And because of that, there's a chance to send them kindness. You know, if we're not aware of something, we can't be kind to it. So mindfulness, for example, would be the quality that says, okay, I feel this difficulty, I feel this pain in the body, and I acknowledge it. You know? And compassion would say, this is difficult, how do I comfort myself? Or how do I care for this experience? So there's a difference there. It's one step further, in a way. It acknowledges that something's difficult and then looks for an appropriate response. Yeah? And it's rather beautiful that compassion and kindness also tend to undermine all the hindrances because they're quite the opposite of wanting and craving and ill will. Yeah? They're the main two hindrances that obscure reality for us. So, com- so mindfulness has this ethical aspect and this aspect of kindness. And, uh, yeah, so I wanted to talk... That's a kind of general context. The other thing about that is that it comes straight after right effort in almost all of the suttas. Okay, so wh- whether mindfulness is seen as one of the five indriyas, five strengths of the mind, it comes right after energy. Yeah, or actually in that one, I think it might... Does it come first? No, it comes, it comes third. So it comes after confidence, energy, and then mindfulness, right? So there's already this energy in the mind and this kind of confidence in the Buddha's teachings, which is similar to right view. Then in the Noble Eightfold Path, it comes directly after right effort. And so this means we've already got this gatekeeper working quite well, seeing what to allow in and what not to. Yeah? And the job then of mindfulness is just to overcome the remaining hindrances, which are more refined at that point. So we don't just go straight into it. We prepare the mind first. And there's a whole gradual training that talks about how to do this. So, yeah, the Buddha also talks about the functions of mindfulness, which I'll just go through briefly, and then you'll see what we're trying to do today. So he says that the functions of mindfulness are initially to help us observe the precepts. Okay. So the five precepts and the breakage of those precepts is seen as an obstacle to developing on the path. So initially, we have to have this awareness to see how and where we're breaking these precepts what kind of reactions we're having, you know, that lead to unwholesome speech and bodily behavior and mental behavior too. So that's the first function of mindfulness. And then the next one is to start to overcome these five hindrances. And then later, when mindfulness develops even more strongly and is more penetrating, we can start to see the wisdom. The wisdom develops that sees arising and passing away of phenomena. So this is a sort of more advanced level of mindfulness, and it's a different strength of mindfulness. So mindfulness has levels. It's not just one thing, you know, let's all be mindful and be aware that we're walking to the kitchen. It has different levels. There's a basic rudimentary mindfulness that everybody has in life. We're all aware, you know, when we're crossing a road, we're aware of the traffic either side. But that's not enough. So it's like you have a teaspoon to dig a hole. That's a kind of basic mindfulness. You know, it works. You can take a little of the earth out. But then when mindfulness starts to get empowered, when the hindrances start to diminish, it's like we have a big spoon or a spade, so we can take more and more earth out of the hole. Yeah? But then after you know, the practice of the Eightfold Path and after the Satipatthanas, when the hindrances are probably almost overcome or even completely overcome through the practice of deep samadhi, the mindfulness is what my teacher calls superpower. And he says, that's like having a digger. You know, you can just go in and like dig as much of the hole out that you, as you could, like in months and months and months with a spoon. <laughs> so there's a difference. 
you know, and, and it's a kind of progressive sequential development of mindfulness. So it works in different ways, different stages on the path. So the first thing I want to have a look at it today, and probably for most of the day, is how mindfulness works to overcome these five hindrances and undermine them so that the deeper states of absorption, of samadhi, become available to us. And we can practice the Satipatthana Sutta also, the practices in there with more, more results. Because a lot of the time we're practicing these, and the Buddha says, you know, it only takes seven days and you can become fully enlightened. But for many of us, you know, including myself, I've been practicing for many years and I'm not yet enlightened. So there's a reason for that. Okay, so the Buddha talks about how are we doing for time. I'll just go through the gradual training for about 10 minutes to talk about how the Buddha describes the training that's a progressive uh, increase and development of mindfulness. So this is from the Majjhima 51, Kandaraka Sutta. And it's a really nice sutta because it talks about the path from the very beginning all the way through to the end. And he starts by saying that the first um, factor to develop is hearing the teachings and developing confidence in them. Yeah? So unless we have a, some amount of confidence, even to the extent that we're willing to try, we're willing to experiment, we can start on the path. Yeah? And from here, the very next thing to develop is a, a sense of contentment and simplicity, which is quite interesting and probably a step that many people skip to some degree. Um, and in this sutta, it actually talks about the simplicity and contentment in the monastic life. So it talks about having the, one's robe and bowl as the only burden, just as a bird has the wings, you know, as the only burden. But actually, in modern day life, you have more than that. I have my whole office in my uh, <laughs> luggage these days. But it's a sense of, you know, living a simple life and with only what you need and not things that you don't need. I heard from a friend of mine who lived in London uh, most of her life, and she's just had a big life change, having started meditation. Um, She's gone to live in Berlin, and she told me every time she thinks about um, acquiring a new asset or, you know, even a car or something like this, she says, is it going to be help or a liability? So recently she decided a car would be a liability because, you know, I guess it costs a lot to maintain. Maybe there's a danger of it getting bumped and scratched. So she said, okay, I'll take a bike. You know, and it's this kind of simplification and sort of happy with what one has that's the groundwork, really, for the precepts and for the rest of the path to, to develop. Yeah. I've also been in Essex, and there's some place called uh, Mount something or other in Essex, and um, you can just see how affluent it is. This area is also very affluent, but over there they have really huge mansions. I think Rod Stewart's mansion was there with I don't know, something like 80 acres of ground, and when they have such big houses, do you feel that they're free? They usually have these big gates on the outside, you know, with a lock, and probably security guards, spiky bits, you know, because there's more to lose. You know, you've constantly got this fear of somebody wanting what I've got, and you know, something that I have and that I've become dependent on being taken from me. Some of the freest times for me were in my life in Asia, just travelling as a scruffy backpacker. I think I had, uh, when I left England, I had 20 pounds um, a week for about two months, and then my funds ran out. (laughs) And I used to cash my little traveler's check at the beginning of the week and figure out which uh, dishes I could eat on the menu. It was usually fried rice or fried noodles. (laughs) And uh, how many chais I could have for, like, two rupees. But it was such a sense of freedom. And at one point, I actually got everything stolen. It was my passport, traveler's checks, and my ticket home. And, I mean, that was a lot to lose all at once. But I don't know. I didn't feel very different. There was a slight... I noticed my bag was slightly lighter, which is what alerted me to the fact that there'd been a a kind of mugging. (laughs) Um, But then I was standing in the street, and it's like, okay, I'm still here. still got my hands, as Ajahn Chito says, actually. He he was like, I can still see my hands. (laughs) Especially if you're traumatized or something. It's like, my hands are there. (laughs) I'm okay. So I felt fine, actually, and uh, bit by bit I managed to replace everything. Um, and now also as a nun, I mean, nobody, I don't think, is going to be very interested in my belongings. <laughs> I mean, I have a little tablet, which is not very easy to work on. Um, <laughs> but mostly it's just a few dirty patches that I haven't yet, you know, sewn onto my robes. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a lot, a lot to lose. And this gives an enormous sense of freedom. And also it feels good. You feel like you're not taking up too much of the world's resources, especially at these times when there's such a huge divide between the rich and the poor. 
you know, across the world. It's, it feels good. It feels ethical. So this is the beginning of kind of giving up and learning that we don't need to depend on so many external things for our own well-being. It gives a lot of confidence when you realize that. So this is the second step in the gradual training. And from there, we move into the uh, sila, which is often translated as precepts, but I tend to think of it more as virtue or ethics because that's much wider than just a few abstinences, you know, a few I shall not. So it's not only about what we don't do and the precepts that we don't break. It's also the active component. And this sutta is particularly beautiful because it really talks about the positive aspect of the sila. And the motivation for that is compassion. So in the suttas, it has this really beautiful phrase. It says, um, um, the Buddha asks one of his disciples, what kind of person do you prefer? I mean, it's quite an obvious answer. And he says, a person who harms himself and harms others. A person who harms himself doesn't harm others. A person who harms others but not themselves. Or a person who harms neither. <laughs> so I think we prefer the one that harms neither. And then the Buddha said, and why is that? And he said... Uh, because all beings desire pleasure and recoil from pain. And I just think that's so lovely because it connects us together. You know, all beings, whether animals, insects, human beings, people we like, even Donald Trump, desires pleasure and recoils from pain, sometimes quite painfully, <laughs> quite detrimentally. <laughs> you know, but that's basically what's driving people's behavior. So starting from this premise of compassion, we can undertake the training in ethical conduct in a really beautiful, positive way as a cultivation of the mind. So we're cultivating positive qualities. You know, I often wondered in my life, sometimes I was around a lot of monastics and they were all keeping these precepts really well, and yet there was something a little bit dry in some mm. cases, you know, something just a bit kind of, I don't know, maybe wanting to be very aloof or not quite responding in a way that felt really wholehearted. I mean, it's not just monastics, it can be anybody. But then I'd come home and, and meet some of my parents' friends who've been teachers or working in the healthcare professions, and they just seemed so wholesome, so caring, and really gentle people. And I think, you know, how come, you know, they maybe do drink alcohol, so they haven't got really perfect conduct. <laughs> but then I thought, well, this sort of explains why, because it's looking at the positive aspects. So it's saying, okay, with rod and weapon, what is it, rod and weapon laid aside, um, one dwells with compassion for all beings, and that's the opposite of killing. Yeah? So it's not just not killing, it dwells compassionate for all beings. And the other nice example is, um, well, there's a lot of examples, but another nice one is the precept not to take what's not given. It actually <coughs> goes on to elaborate, and it says to expect only what's given. So it's like not even allowing your mind to go outside of what you already have, you know, not even expecting that something else better is coming along. And then it's also, obviously, the opposite of that is giving. It's generosity. And this is praised again and again by the Buddha as being the beginning of the path. And it's because it's a letting go. It's a letting go. And it's a giving up, a giving away. Yeah? And it, it's this connection between oneself and others. Just as I seek my own happiness and recall from pain, so do others. What can I do to contribute? What can I do to give? And as a monastic, often I'm on the receiving end, and sometimes it can feel quite uncomfortable. But <coughs> I realized a while ago that receiving is also a kind of giving, because you're giving people the opportunity to practice generosity. And it's not about me as a recipient. It's nothing to do with that. I think this is so clear in Asian cultures. I lived in Burma for a long time, and some of the most generous people, and they just, you know, they actually feel quite embarrassed if you say thank you too profusely, because it's almost as though you're taking it personally, that they've done something for you. They don't feel that way. They feel that it's just a natural part of the human heart to give. And it's a privilege for them, you know, to be able to do that. Once my parents came to visit me in Burma, and, um, and there were some people in the village where the monks used to go on arms round, and I used to go from time to time as well. Not with a bowl, because you weren't allowed a bowl, but with my bare feet and just to some houses. And some of these villagers would invite us in and give us the best food they had, which was maybe a sweet or something like this. You know, Normally they just eat rice, but they might have a special something. And my parents came and uh, went to meet them, and they brought them a big box of chocolates. Mm -hmm. And this was just you know, something they'd probably never seen. And they just calmly, without a word, just took it with a very solemn and beautiful, humble expression and just placed it on the, on the altar with the Buddha. And it was so lovely. It just felt like it was just sliding between, from you know, one pair of hands into another, but there was almost no difference. You know? It was just this beautiful flow. 
And I just thought that was so inspiring to me, you know. I mean, in, you know, when people are very underprivileged, often there can be a kind of grabbing and, you know, you can understand why. But in this case, it was done with so much grace. It was just beautiful. Another op- uh, occasion that happened to me was when I was in uh, Madras in, I think, 1995 or so. And um, I was waiting with my then boyfriend, who was Tibetan, so it was quite good because we were quite, you know, he could speak the language and I felt very much at home anyway in India. Um, and we were waiting for a train and sort of in the street, and I don't think it was raining or particularly hot, but this um, family of beggars on the street saw us and they were just living like under a tarpaulin kind of shelter, completely open at the front, and they invited us in. So we sort of went in and stood at the side and, um, and they said, would you like some food? And they were making this kind of gruel, which looked sort of, you know, kind of uh, probably very poor quality grains, just boiled up with water and a bit of salt. But they offered it with their whole heart, and it was just so lovely to see that even though they had nothing, you know, they had this dignity to want to give. They didn't feel they had nothing. They hadn't labelled themselves that way. It was like they could still take part in that virtuous cycle, as somebody recently called it. Yeah. Instead of a vicious cycle, you can have a virtuous cycle. So it's just a cycle of generating and sharing happiness. And I think that's what the precepts really ought to be, what Sila really is. You know, it's actually something very creative and beautiful, something that we can really milk and, you know, looking at life from the sense of, okay, how many acts of kindness can I do today? Or how many acts of kindness do I see around me? You know, there's a lot. There's really a lot. <coughs> the other side of the ethical conduct that I think is really important and often a little bit overlooked. It's certainly, as a monastic, I see that that's the one we have to work with because we've got everything else pretty much sorted with the rules. But the aspect of speech is really uh, challenging. You know, our speech can really harm or help other beings, and you know, one wrongly placed word can have huge effects if we don't do it with care and, and concern for the other or at the right time. So not only do we abstain from there's a, an acronym I made F. For my higher good, it's like FM, for my higher good, HG. So it's abstain from false speech, for my malicious speech, higher, (laughs) harsh speech, and good gossip. We abstain from those. So that's a helpful way to remember it. And then the opposite of that is uh, instead of, for example, um, harsh speech, which divides, we speak words that promote concord, words that bring people together. You know, and it says in the sutras, one is a lover of concord, rejoices in concord, delights in concord. And this is so beautiful, you know. Often it's the case that, you know, you see two people who are not having a good relationship together. You know, you might not want to get involved, sometimes it's not always the way, but what if we could bring them together, you know? If some aspect of our speech could, you know, promote the good of the other to to someone else, instead of always fault finding. You know, we can actually actively look for the good in each other and talk about that. You know, often we have these kind of lovely concepts and impressions of people, but people only hear about it or they don't hear about it. They hear about it at their funeral, you know. (laughs) Hopefully they can hear it, but it's usually too late and people go into all the beautiful things, you know, that people feel about them and appreciate about them, but they never got to hear it in their life. This is really so sad. So at least in our monastery in Perth, we used to, on our birthdays, we used to write cards for each other and everyone would write, you know, in somebody's card. And it was really like a celebration of that person's qualities and their life. It was really very beautiful. I kept every card I got, actually, because they're just lovely. And they help you see sides of yourself that you might not notice. You know. And there's a certain kind of uh, courage required, I think, in, in offering words that uplift and words that, value and, and show appreciation for another. Especially in this culture, we're often quite shy about doing that. You know, It's like, oh, what will they think? Or they might think I'm trying to flatter them. Or... But the thing is, we don't hear praise very often. There's been some kind of study that shows it takes something like one or two seconds to receive a word of criticism and about 20 or 30 seconds to receive praise. It just doesn't go in. You know, and we don't let it in. We're like, no, 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 you're great, you're great. No, no, it's not true. <laughs> but how about just saying, oh, thanks for that. I know that when I give praise to people or want to kind of say, oh, I see this in you that I really admire, and they don't accept it, it's quite a struggle. It's like, no, I want to give it, I want to tell you this. No, no, no. It's like, can you just take it, you know? <laughs> it happened to me last year on the Mains Retreat, you know, this 
other nun, who's a lovely, lovely person, she just couldn't take the things I was saying. And I'm like, if you just say thank you, I'll feel so relieved. And she did, and the whole energy changed. <laughs> yeah, it's, again, dissolving the boundaries between oneself and others. So this is a sealer aspect, and I'm going on quite a long time, but I think that's quite important because, you know, this comes before we get anywhere close to mindfulness. And, of course, you know, you can also develop mindfulness in order to improve the sealer, but if we can cultivate this in our everyday life, then by the time we sit on the cushion, our minds are really ready. You know, we have that sense of, the Buddha calls it um, blameless bliss. So he's saying, you know, that the gradual training is a progressive refinement of joy, like spiritual joy. <clears throat> so that we're less and less dependent on the world of the five senses for our pleasure. And he calls the bliss of Sila, of keeping virtuous conduct, the blameless bliss. And it's subtle, but I think for people who have observed these precepts for a long time and who actively cultivate kindness and compassion in everyday life, there's a certain sense of, a sense that, yes, I'm a good person, you know, yes, I'm, I'm doing my best in life. And there's a certain confidence that comes with that. And it is a kind of bliss. You're free from remorse. You know? We don't often notice it, but I think it's important to take the time to notice. Yeah? So then the next uh, factor in this gradual training is something called sense restraint. And I think the word restraint is often a little bit, ooh, I don't know about this restraint. It feels like a bit of a straight jacket or something. But the Buddha didn't mean it in the sense that we avoid looking at things outside. He just said that we have to guard our mind in the sense that the objects outside don't lead to unwholesome states of rising. Yeah? So it's like we see somebody who may generate a feeling of lust or attraction. Rather than focusing, we don't kind of avoid that, you know, because that would be a kind of suppression. But rather than focusing on those features that lead to those, you know, states arising that may be quite agitating or, you know, may take you out of your sort of balance, you look at different aspects of the person, you know. I like to look at people as brothers and sisters, you know, or potential past mothers or fathers, you know, and just see the fragility that we all share as a human being. This kind of quickly undermines that kind of thing for me, although it's not really one of my weaknesses. But, uh, yeah, say if, I don't know, you have a fondness for like a fast, fast cars or something. Some people do. They see a car and they think, wow, I want that. You know, it's like reflecting in a way that doesn't lead to that craving. So maybe looking at the dangers in that or looking at the fact that, you know, it can get bumped and scratched. You know, or it's a lot to maintain, something like this. So it's like looking at experience in a skillful way so that these unwholesome states don't come into the mind and invade our mind. Yeah? And that's quite, again, it's tied into right effort. It's the first right effort, which is restraining the enemies coming in. Yeah? And then when they have come in, we have to learn how to ask them to leave. And there are very many methods that the Buddha talked about for asking them to leave in a very kind way. And that's in another sutta called the Vitaka Santana Sutta in uh, Majjhima 20, for those who want to look it up. And uh, in there he talks about five ways to abandon unwholesome thoughts. But it could be unwholesome anything, unwholesome motivation, unwholesome states of mind, unwholesome reactions. Often they do manifest as thoughts. And so in there he says that the first way and the best way to overcome these unwholesome states is to, or to, you know, if they have come in, to, to diminish them, not to feed them, is to substitute. So the first one is substituting an unwholesome thought, for example, with a wholesome thought. So a practical example of that would be if one has a tendency to aversion, maybe cultivating metta as one's main practice to overcome this tendency to aversion. Or if, on the other hand, one has a tendency to lust and desire, we could cultivate the practice of observing the body in terms of its parts, in terms of its various uh, organs and you know, skin, teeth, bones, and all the various organs, not to kind of develop aversion or a sense of rep repulsion towards the body, but just to bring some kind of measure of balance in there to see more of the picture because again these hindrances are just distorting and only showing us one side of a situation yeah so that's the substitution method it can also be just with an object as such as the breath You're substituting the thought for the breath you don't push it away but you bring the breath into the center of the screen so to speak yeah and you allow the other things to slip off the side so that's one of the ways and then the next one is um is that the next? Seeing the danger in unwholesome thoughts. Yeah? 
And in the text, it says something very nice about, you know, this thought will not lead to my um, well-being or to the benefit of others, and it will lead away from Nibbana. <coughs> so it's about identifying whether this thought is wholesome or not and where it's going. Yeah. So it's what am I doing? Where is it leading me? <laughs> yeah, we need to be aware of that and, and then change the course. So he didn't say we have to just observe everything that comes and follow it. He said we can obs- we can change the course of that thought. You know, if I start to kind of dwell on all the things that a person's done that have upset me, I can say, okay, this isn't leading me anywhere. It's dangerous. It's not helping me. It's not going to affect the other person. It's just going to tire me out and lead to... I mean, the Buddha says that basically if you carry on that train of thought, it becomes like your inclination. You keep on going back along the same line of fault-finding, you know, and criticism. And then later it becomes your character. You know, you see it with people. Over the years they get hardened and the sort of line set in and the anger sets in. And, you know, and this is all because we haven't noticed when it's starting to arise and we haven't learned how to substitute it and look in a different way. So this seeing the danger is also very helpful and then we can substitute <coughs> you know, with the more wholesome reflections or bringing up that person's positive qualities. And if not, the next method that the Buddha mentions is ignoring. And ignoring can sound a little bit harsh, (coughs) but what it really means is not feeding, not giving it attention. And there's a little story that you might have all heard, but I think it's worth reading it anyway, which uh, brings home the idea of ignoring and also knowing how to attend to something wholesome. So a parable about a young Cherokee who was brought before the tribal elders is concerned about his aggressive tendencies. One of the elders takes the young man aside and tells him that his anger is understandable since all humans have within them two wolves. One wolf is good and peaceable. The other is mean and angry. The two wolves are in constant battle with one another since neither is powerful enough to destroy the other. The young man asks the elder, but if they're of equal power, which wolf will win? And the elder replies, the one you feed the most. (laughs) I think we can all relate to that, you know, and yet a lot of the time we do feed these negative tendencies by dwelling on them or by just following them through, you know, going along a certain line of thinking. And that's really feeding the wolf. You can also see it as um, watering the weeds and not the flowers. We've got these little bags that... um, a group of volunteers made for our um, project to start the monastery in England. And uh, on there, one of Ajahn Brown's quotes, uh, water the flowers, not the weeds. <coughs> and this is really the whole path of cultivation, you know. You can spend a lot of time plucking out the weeds if you want to, but equally you can water the flowers and they tend to smother the weeds at some point. They just grow and you just leave the weeds alone and... I don't know if that's really true in gardening, but (laughs) at least least in the mind we hope that if we just ignore it and we don't feed it, you know, that can undermine its power. It's like the guests that come in, you just ignore them and don't feed them. I mean, they're not going to stay long, you know, they're going to go somewhere else. So that's another way. And then the last one is uh, to actually overcome the thoughts by slowing things down. And he talks about that as calming the volition. I'm not exactly sure the words he uses, but it basically means kind of catching things early. So if you feel like an unwholesome tendency arising, you can feel it at the level of motivation before it even comes into a thought. You you can kind of see if this particular energy was allowed to develop, it would lead this way. And you can actually slow yourself right down. One thing I like to do is put space between the thoughts, like observe silence, observe, notice the silence between them. You can even use a mantra. So, again, substitution, put in a mantra there, like, may I be happy. But you can put in spaces between the words, may, I, (laughs) be. So you have these spaces, you know. So you're starting to listen in to what's around all this kind of stuff going around the mind. And this is a way of kind of slowing things down. Yeah? So that's the sense restraint in a nutshell. But it's something I want to bring in because I think it's often overlooked in the practice. And after this sense restraint, then only in the gradual training, the Buddha says, then one seeks a secluded place. And sense restraint is also said to cultivate a certain kind of happiness, which is called the bliss of uh, the unblemished bliss bliss which is unsolid something like this 
So I think that what that means is it's not so dependent on external things. It's something that's coming from within. And it's a kind of refinement of the silo. It's more looking at the ethics in, term of, in terms of the mental content, the mental conduct. Yeah? Whereas the other silos were focused on body and speech, this one's more focused on the mind. What are we doing internally that's you know, leading to our happiness or not? So we have already these two kinds of blisses. We have this ease that comes from living a life of virtue, and then only we go into seclusion. Yeah? And then it talks about the Satipatthana Sutta. It starts by, well, actually, it starts by talking about the hindrances. But um, it says, you know, first one establishes mindfulness as a priority. So then we have this sense of, okay, I'm here. Yeah? And then the next job is to start undermining the hindrances. Ris- rif- what would you call it? Restraining them, I think, at this stage before they're fully abandoned. Yeah? And you all know what the hindrances are, which is great. Um, one aspect of the hindrances is that they actually obscure clear seeing, so the Buddha likens them to water. And he says, you know, obviously it's inferred that a still mind is like a still lake. Yeah? But then he says that a mind with sensual desire is like water that's been dyed, so it's coloured. You can't actually see very clearly. It's like if you have rose-tinted glasses on, everything looks pink. And then he says that for ill will, it's like boiling water. So again, you can't see through to the bottom because it's just all churned up and it's so hot. You know, everything you look at just turns kind of a shade of red. <laughs> and then the third one, uh, the, uh, the restlessness, is it next? Or the sloth and torpor? Sloth and torpor, he says, is like moss, which is coming over the water. So it's starting to creep in. You know, and you have to keep kind of pulling it back to see through into the water, but it keeps on coming in. So it's like it's not allowing you to see and it's making you very drowsy. Everything looks kind of murky. And then the, la- uh, the what is it next? Restlessness and remorse. He says it's like the wind is stirring up the water. So you've seen on the sea when it's not really wavy but it's kind of choppy and the colour changes as well and it just looks very unsettled. So that's like a mindful of restlessness and that can't sit on the object. It can't hold attention on any one thing. It's always off into the past or the present or anywhere but now, past or the future. And then the last one is the mind with doubt, and he likens that to the water which is uh, murky and cloudy. Yeah? So you don't really know what's going on. You're quite confused. He also says this is like being lost in the desert. You, know, you don't know your way. And there's no nourishment there. You can't really pick up something and follow it through. You're like, what's skillful, what's unskillful? I don't know if I'm doing it right, you know. And you don't ever have the capacity to just try it out. It's different from kind of a cynical kind of doubt, or maybe maybe cynical doubt's not the best. But there's another kind of doubt which can be a good thing, where we feel, okay, I'm not sure about this, let me explore it. But doubt as a hindrance is kind of like, I'm confused, I can't even begin to explore it. Or I've just rejected something outright, you know. Yeah, I'll try not to talk about secular Buddhism, but sometimes... You know, it feels like an outright rejection rather than an open-minded, I don't know yet. And doubt, which is healthy, is the kind of, I don't know yet, let me explore this more deeply. It's not landing on something yet. So these are the hindrances. And one of the um, hindrances that I just want to give a little bit of attention to is um, the hindrance of um, ill will, because this is probably one of the most common, especially perhaps for Westerners who've been trained to think critically, to evaluate experience a lot, and to really kind of get into the nitty-gritty of things. We tend to have these very sharp minds that can border a little bit on ill will. So we're looking for the faults. We're looking how to improve things. And again, this compassionate attitude undermines that because apparently with compassion, we're less Mm fault-finding, we're less perfectionists. And I could, you know, I think the people who've been around me recently realise I'm quite a perfectionist sometimes. And I think with more self-compassion training, you know, I'll be less concerned about making everything just right. (laughs) So, um, yeah, the anger can be towards another person, you know, outright anger, which hopefully none of us have too strongly, although sometimes people in the political scene these days kind of are quite difficult to develop meta towards. And anger towards another person is overcome through the practice of meta and compassion, And then sometimes just taking a step back and saying, well, all beings are the owners of their karma. You know, there's nothing I can really do, but they're going to 
yeah, their behavior is going to lead in a certain way and it's going to bring them suffering. You, know? you can have compassion for that, but sometimes there's nothing more you can do. You just need to leave it to come. You know? And I mean, usually if people are behaving in really detrimental ways, they're suffering. You know? They're already suffering. I mean, they don't have to wait for the future. So this can really help. And then again, reflecting on the danger. In the, set, in the text, it says that anger is like punching someone whilst holding a burning coal in your hand. <laughs> so, you know, obviously, if you can do that, you're going to hurt yourself immediately before you even land the punch. <laughs> and I'm sure no one's going to land one. But so that's another aspect. And then there's also, um, yeah, the Buddha says, wise companionship and suitable conversation is another way to overcome anger and I think again you know it's kind of bringing up the positives bringing up the wholesome when you can talk to somebody about the precepts about the training it tends to bring it up in your mind and you know you get ideas you get inspiration it keeps you on the right track yeah so suitable conversation and wise friendship because we're very much conditioned about <laughs> by, by who we're around and then the other thing to uh, about anger is that it can be towards another but often it's towards ourselves. And we have this ill will towards ourselves, which can prevent us actually going deeper <coughs> in meditation. And this often comes up in the deeper levels of meditation, especially if a lot of bliss starts to arise, you know, in the practice, which is not a sensual kind of bliss, but it's just the bliss of having let go of a lot and the kind of happiness that can arise, a contentment and joy that's really an internal um, quality. And I know for many people it's quite common that they feel at this point, oh dear, what's going wrong, you know, maybe I don't deserve this. Oh, it can't be right, you know, I haven't worked hard enough for this. Maybe I need to go back to the beginning, you know. And there's this kind of uh, resistance to enjoying oneself in the practice. And often this is a kind of ill will towards oneself. Or it can come from guilt, you know, there's something that you haven't yet forgiven yourself for. And because of that, you don't feel you deserve happiness. So forgiveness is also a really beautiful way to overcome anger towards oneself. Or ill will and it can be subtle I mean we're not talking about outright rage but it's just this kind of slightly negative or mean perception we have of ourselves that we'd never have of someone else so at least we'd never verbalize mm-hmm. you know but we feel we can do it to ourselves no one can see <laughs> and then the other one that's quite interesting is uh, ill will towards the meditation object yeah and this is one that's not often discussed but Ajahn Brown makes much of this because he, I think he's seen in people who practice that you know, when they go on to the breath, for example, especially if they go on to it too early in the practice and it's hard to, to stay with, they tend to get very controlling because they don't really like this object. It's not interesting. It kind of keeps slipping away, you know. And then you develop this quite a negative relationship with the meditation object. You don't see the joy in it, you know, because you're trying to control. And because you maybe don't have the confidence yet also, you feel like you have to kind of keep interfering, bring it back, bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> And actually, if you practice the whole gradual training from the beginning, you're preparing your mind to be ready to receive the breath. It's not that you need to go out there and grab it and drag it in. It'll never really stay. You know, but when we cultivate the mind as a kind of beautiful home that we can invite these lovely qualities and these objects into, it becomes kind of part of you. You know, oh, this breath that's just coming, born from my womb, you know, just coming from the air, coming through my body. Just this simple little breath. And we can develop a much, much nicer relationship with it. Yeah? So all these things are the hindrances that need to be undermined, and there are many ways to undermine them. And then only in the gradual training, the Buddha talks about starting the, either the Satipatthana Sutta, the Satipatthana Methods, or going into jhanas, because when the hindrances are overcome, the deeper states of meditation do become available to us. And from there, you know, we really develop such strong stillness and such penetrative power in the mind that when we then practice the Satipatthana methods, we can penetrate very, very deeply in a way that is never possible with just kind of, you know, the mindfulness that's rolling in hindrances. So this is kind of the gradual path, and I think this overcoming of hindrances is quite key to it, and it's very much fun. (laughs) So I hope... We can do some practice. And, uh, yeah, I wanted to do a guided meditation. I realize we've been, I've been talking a while, so I don't know if people would like to have a five-minute break first, and then we'll do some meditation about right attitude. Yeah? Good. <coughs>